Well, welcome to part two of plate tectonics theory and evidence. Hi, welcome to Exploring the World Ocean. I'm Sean Chamberlain. Welcome to part two of plate tectonics theory and evidence. In today's lecture, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the evidence that supports plate tectonics. In our previous lecture, we talked about what is plate tectonics and sort of how does it operate on the face of our planet. We also talked about how plate tectonics accounts for many of the features that we see on Earth. It can explain volcanoes, it can explain oceanic trenches, mid-ocean ridges, the origins of the Hawaiian Islands, it can explain earthquakes. Today what we want to do is take a little bit closer look at the actual evidence that supports plate tectonics. Just because we have trenches and mountain ranges and volcanoes and earthquakes and those kinds of things isn't in and of itself enough evidence. So let's kind of take a look at what pieces of evidence lent support to the theories of plate tectonics and its ultimate acceptance in the 1960s. Well, it first started out as an idea that the continents kind of move about, and this was first proposed by Alfred Wegener, who was a German meteorologist. Wegener looked at the continents and looked at other pieces of evidence and suggested that the continents move, or at some time, at some time in Earth's history, had moved, that they drift. And he wrote a book called On the Theory of Continental Drift. He actually presented in that book several different lines of circumstantial evidence that the continents were once joined together and had moved apart since that time. But unfortunately, being a meteorologist, being a European scientist who kind of looked at things a little bit differently than the American scientists, and generally the whole idea of continents moving around just wasn't appealing to scientists in 1915 when Wegener first proposed his idea. And so it was generally scoffed at and laughed at, and Wegener died in a trip up to Greenland, um, and kind of obscurity at the time. But as we'll see, as fate has it, Wegener was right. Well, Wegener first noted that the continents fit together, and if you've ever looked at a map, and maybe as a young school kid, you looked at a map and said, hey, if we slide South America over to Africa, they kind of fit together. Who wouldn't have noticed that? Map makers had noticed that for hundreds of years prior to Wegener. So just that idea that they kind of look like they fit together, even though it's not sufficient evidence, is a good start. Wegener took a little bit closer look. He looked at rock formations on opposing coasts of South America and Africa. They were the same kinds of rocks. Well, how did that happen? Why would you have the same kinds of rocks on two continents that were completely separate from each other if at one time they weren't joined? And he also looked at fossils on the different continents. And what he found was the different kinds of animals or different kinds of fossils that you found on the different continents could only be explained if the continents were at once joined together. And he took a view of it like this. If you kind of combine the continents together in one giant continent, which he called Pangaea, it makes sense that something like a fern, which can be found in Australia, Antarctica, India, Africa, South America, if we join them together, then finding those fern fossils on the continent separately makes a little bit more sense. It's a little bit easier to accept. Those that don't believe the theory would argue, well, the fern was carried by other animals or it was blown by the wind from one continent to the other. Well, let's look at another kind of animal, Lystosaurus, a type of dinosaur. We also find fossils of it in Antarctica, India, Africa. How did that animal get from one place to the other if the continents weren't once joined? And of course, opponents would say, well, they took a ride on a log during a storm, or they swam from one to the other. And we can look at this with other types of fossils, Sinanathus, same kind of thing. We find it on South America and Africa. And note, too, that it occurred on South America and Africa, we find Sinanathus fossils right next to each other. We didn't find them over here and over here, which wouldn't have helped us at all, but we found them in a, in a broad zone that makes most sense if the continents are joined together. And one of my favorites, Mesosaurus, one of the sea reptiles, 
um, really voracious predator. We find it as well. We find fossils of these organisms in Africa and South America as well. How else do we explain the distribution of fossils if the continents weren't once joined? That was a question Wegener asked. Other people said, mm, there must be another explanation. The p continents can't possibly move. Well, in those early 1900s, people, uh, seismologists were starting to set up instruments to record the seismic waves that move through Earth. And you felt those seismic waves before. You felt the jolt, the primary wave, and then the kind of rocking and rolling of the secondary wave. And it's those two types of waves, those S waves and P waves, that tell us something about the interior of the Earth because they travel through the interior of the Earth in a different way. And we're not going to get into the details of that. But suffice it to say that on the basis of how those waves travel through the interior of the Earth and looking at seismograms from different places around Earth, scientists piece together this three-part structure of Earth that we talked about earlier, the crust, the mantle, and the core. And in the early 1920s, excuse me, in the late 1920s, British geologist Arthur Holmes proposed the idea of mantle convection. Just like a boiling pot of water, he proposed that the mantle, through heating and that sort of overturning of that mantle material, pulled the continents or pulled the crust apart, made them move, okay, in that sort of sense. And so, even though Wegener's ideas sort of died in obscurity uh, in 1920s, some aspects of that were still being entertained. And this famous British geologist, Arthur Holmes, proposed that as possibly a way that continents would, could move. He didn't have any evidence for it at the time, but at least it got people thinking in the right direction. And here's kind of what that looks like. And this is a figure you can find um, on the USGS site. As that molten material heats up, it moves the plates apart at oceanic ridges, and then the plates cool and subduct at the plate boundaries and subduction zones. Another thing that came to pass was in the 1930s, really, uh, in 1940s through 50s, as a result of echo sounding, a technique used to look at the seafloor and measure the depth of the seafloor uh, that we'll talk a little bit more about in the next chapter, oceanographers discovered a mountain range in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Two oceanographers in particular, Bruce Hees and, and Marie Tharp, produced a map that showed a clearly visible mountain range in the middle of the ocean. That was a complete shock and surprise to scientists. What was a mountain range doing in the middle of the ocean? How do we explain that mountain range based on the ideas of a static earth um, that were popular and current at that time. And if we look at a world ocean map from modern times, here we see this vast mountain range, the oceanic ridges that wraps around our planet like the, like the seams on a baseball it's been described. Where did those come from? What theory of the earth could explain those?